dear friends, both here and abroad, as it were, welcome to the sixth annual lecture of the Scottish Fiscal Institute. And welcome to the Diocese of Glasgow and Galloway, and welcome to the University of Glasgow. I have welcomed you in that order because the SEI is very dear to my own heart. The Diocese of Glasgow and Galloway is equally very dear to my own heart. And the University of Glasgow was actually founded by one of my predecessors. So I feel that that is the appropriate order. He's over there watching me and giving me strength. We are very delighted, I'm delighted, to have Dr. Michael Hull actually lecture to us tonight. Mike is Director of Studies, and I think I had some little part in appointing him, actually. So that's another point to me. I don't wish to emphasize my distinguished career, but it seems as though it's emerging anyway. So welcome to Mike. And we look forward to the lecture. Mike has also established the, the journal of the Scottish Episcopal Institute, which has actually taken us into international waters as an institute. And that is another way in which the Scottish Episcopal Church is make, continues to make its mark in the, Ang in the Anglican Communion. And I think we are the only church in the Anglican Communion to follow the request of the Lambeth Conference in 1978 to drop the filioque clause from modern lit liturgies. So, Mike, after that build-up, we are delighted that you're here, delighted that we are able to meet tonight in person, and delighted that you are in Glasgow and in this distinguished university. Let's take a step. Thank you. Thank you. So as you're no doubt aware, the title of tonight's talk is To Filioque or Not to Filioque, The Warrant of Holy Scripture. And anyone who's turned up for this talk is no doubt aware of the filioque controversy, about 1,500 years worth of it. Despite all the attempts that have been made, the same controversy goes on and on. It remains unsettled and unresolved. Now, I'll give you a spoiler alert. It's not going to be settled this evening. It's not going to be resolved here at all. You'll know, though, that the roots of the controversy lie in interpretations and translations of the Nicene Creed from its original Greek into Latin. Now, no one has ever sought to change the Greek text of the Creed. No one has ever sought to go back on what was pronounced in 381 at Constantinople or at Chalcedon in 451. But oddly enough, by the fifth century, the Latin version of a part of the creed, a very specific part that reads in Greek, ta ek tu patros ek poru omenon, which we would expect to be translated more or less as who proceeds from the father, somehow began to appear in parts of Spain in Latin as qui ex patre filioque crociated, who proceeds from the father and the son. This translation, perhaps it's better to say an interpretation or a rendition, spread somewhat unassumingly. Well, it was probably meant to buttress belief in the divinity of Christ against strains of Arianism in the day. In other words, those who denied the divinity of Christ and to echo a widely held Augustinian Trinitarianism, which had its roots at least in the fourth century. By the sixth century, the creed, 
in the Greek of the East and in the Latin of the West, including the Filioque, bedded down into the Eucharistic liturgies. By the late eighth century, the East became increasingly aware of the Filioque and took umbrage at it as it does to this day. The issue of the Filioque though was kind of overshadowed by the larger issue of iconoclasm. And although it came up in the eighth century, it was really at the Synod of Gentile in 767 that the first spark of a fire was kindled. And that fire, as you know, is still burning today. It is, I shall argue this evening, the Filioque controversy was and is today not really about the F word per se. That's not really the problem. It's a fundamentally different understanding of the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit between the East and the West. Now, I'll make no attempt to recount the history of that controversy, as tempting as that would be, because it's filled with theological subtleties, political intrigues, and of course, vicious invectives that you can only get in Latin and in Greek. And I shall make no attempt to try to define the surfeit of terms in Greek or in Latin that have been used and abused in the Filioque controversy, other than to say that the choppy waters of those diverse definitions, words like hypostasis and ousia, words like essentia and persona, words used by East and West by loads of theologians, well, those choppy waters are almost unnavigable. It is recorded, though, that a Byzantine theologian back at the Council of Ferrara, Florence in the 15th century, where East and West made perhaps their biggest attempt, which eventually failed, to put this all together, that as he listened to the Latins using philosophical categories to talk about the Trinity, to make points about the filioque, he became so frustrated that he stood up and exclaimed, why Aristotle? Aristotle is no good. What is good? St. Paul, St. Basil, Gregory the theologian, Chrysostom, not Aristotle, not Aristotle. Imagine a Greek getting up, telling Latins not to defer to Aristotle. Goes to show you how complex this situation is. One thing though, that I'll try to keep clear is a distinction between the term filioque and the doctrine in it denotes. Because whether we filioque or not, the doctrinal divide between East and West on the procession of the spirit will remain long beyond this evening. But don't take my word for that. Take it from an Orthodox theologian, perhaps one of the most famous Orthodox theologians of the 20th century, Vladimir Lasky. He said about 50 years ago, and I quote, whether we like it or not, the question of the procession of the Holy Spirit has been the sole dogmatic grounds for the separation of East and West, close quote. By the ninth century, indeed, a formal separation, a schism was in the air as the East and the West considered their positions. But by then, the Frankish custom of chanting the creed in Latin with the filioque had reached Jerusalem and the flames of controversy were fanned. Pope Leo III, who had crowned Charlemagne emperor on Christmas day in the year 800 without approval from Constantinople was, it may be said, diplomatic in his solution. Leo held on the one hand that the filioque theologically speaking, was entirely orthodox. And by filioque, he meant the doctrine. He was so firm in that, that he is reported to have said, it is forbidden not to believe such a great mystery of faith. Yet on the other hand, Leo opposed the use of the term filioque in Latin versions of the creed. In fact, he forbade it. He had two silver shields engraved with the creed, one in Greek and one in Latin, without the filioque, and he hung them in old St. Peter's Basilica in the hope of keeping the church together. 
Now I say diplomatic insofar as Leo tried to forestall a schism by conceding something to one side and something to the other side. That is, more or less, he tried a solution that has continued to be proffered by several Western Christians, particularly Anglicans and the World Council of Churches in the 20th and 21st centuries in ecumenical discussions around this controversy. But alas, Leo's diplomacy did not work in the ninth century, and it hasn't worked any time later. Still, his solution extends to his acknowledgement, again, like it or not, that there was dissonance in the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit in the up to then undivided church of God that need not be emphasized in any way, lest it cause division, especially with an already contentious filioque. The meanwhile, in the East, Thucius, the patriarch of Constantinople, took a different position. In a sort of reverse interpolation to the one the West had been accused of making with the filioque, to the effect that the Holy Spirit proceeded, as Thucius said, from the Father alone. Now, that may seem like a sound conclusion from the Greek text of the Creed, but it was by no means the consensus of Eastern theologians then, never mind Eastern or Western theologians today. Again, in order to emphasize the doctrine of procession solely from the Father, Fossi has suggested that it would be good to think of the Creed as instead of saying to ek tu patros, as to ek muno tu patros. In other words, the spirit proceeds from the Father alone. Now, it must be highlighted that Fuzius never suggested changing the wording of the creed itself. But as Fuzius's understanding of the doctrine gained ground in the East, and it gained an enormous amount of ground that still holds to this day, just at about the same time in the West, the so-called Athanasian Creed, the quicumque volt, as we call it in Latin, better, I think, called the pseudo-Athanasian Creed, because Athanasius was already dead a few centuries by then, so it's kind of like Moses and Deuteronomy, you know? It was coming into its own, and it reads in this way, the Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So you can imagine that by the 11th century, there were, of course, continued political intrigues around the imperial government, especially after the deplorable and barbarous behavior of the crusaders in the East. There were other religious issues, like whether or not we should use leavened bread at the Eucharist. All of those things were going here and there and back and forth, but the filioque was the center of attention and the East and the West fighting in such a way that Michael Sorelius, who was then the Patriarch of Constantinople, met with someone from the West, Cardinal Umber Silva Candida. He represented the Roman side. They began to hurl insults and anathemas at one another until Humber laid a bull of excommunication on the altar of Hagia Sophia, against Michael, just as the divine liturgy was about to begin, and then wisely fled the jurisdiction. On the 16th of July in 1054, the fire burned brightly. But again, the kindling for that fire was not the term filioque really, it wasn't the F word. The kindling was what East and West believed after centuries of theological speculation about the Holy Trinity and the procession of the Holy Spirit therein. Moreover, it was about the warrants of their beliefs. That is, on what basis do we agree a doctrine of the Holy Spirit? In other words, you can take the term filioque out of the Latin translation of the creed, you can take it out of the English, 
But you can take the doctrine of the filioque way out of the Western deposit of faith. So now, two points, if you will, from the fifth century before I proceed, if you're part of the pun, about why I think this is so important, even if some others do not. First, it is not simply so that the East and West believe the same thing about the procession of the Holy Spirit, but express it in different ways. That's often said, it's not true. The Vincentian canon comes in as noteworthy here because insofar as the undivided church of God has shown evidence, in other words, going back to the fourth, the fifth, and the centuries we've gone through already, it has never settled the issue of the relations between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Vincent of Lawrence reminds us that a test of truth is whether or not something has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. And although the Greek text of the creed is settled, its interpretation and its translation have been and remain diverse. And that's important. That's very, very important. It probably has something to do with the fact that the West was following along with St. Augustine, as I mentioned. But what is true is by the late sixth century, the filioque way achieved a level of acceptance in the West that borders on unanimity, even if it wasn't so in the East. So we've not been on the same page for a very, very long time. Second, we ought to pray as we believe and believe as we pray. The rule or the law of prayer and belief, usually associated with Prosper of Aquitaine, is that the church prays as the church believes, and the church believes as the church prays. So if the creeds in Greek and in Latin, filioque included, became the constitutive elements, or at least a constitutive element of the Eucharistic liturgy in both the East and the West. And if those creeds continue to be used for a millennium and a half in their respective churches, meanwhile, their theologians debated fiercely over the doctrine of the filioque at Lyon, at Florence, on and on it went. If they debated without agreement for all that time, it is fair enough to say that there is a difference of belief, no matter how major or minor it may be to some, that cannot be glossed over by rubbing out the term filioque and therefore thinking the doctrine is rubbed out too. I say that because, as you will know better than I, a scruzzle, if you will, of the service books in the West, especially in Anglican and Reformed churches, well, a perusal would show that the filioque way has fallen on hard times, as Bishop Kevin mentioned. In my own tradition, the Scottish Episcopal Church, that's largely because of events in the wider world of the Anglican Communion and Reformed Christianity, which we'll come to in a moment. But as Bishop Kevin mentioned, the SEC dropped the filioque way from its most recent Eucharistic liturgy in 1982. But the SEC retains the filioque way in its two other authorized communion services. And as some of you may know, because I can see the books in the back, in the most recent book of the Kirk's Book of Common, most recent edition, I should say, of the books of the Kirk's Book of Common Order and elsewhere, you'll find the and the psalm in little square brackets. So in my own ministry, I preside now and again at the 1929 book of Scottish, the Scottish Book of Common Prayer Eucharist, if you will, where I am seemingly a filioquist. But I also preside at 1982 Eucharist, where I am seemingly a monopatrist. I confess to you and to Almighty God, my brothers and sisters, to filioquine and to not filioquine. But I must confess further that at least to me, that practice has settled or resolved no questions about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Instead, it's kind of left me with questions, which is better and doesn't matter. So what is the question? Well, as I try to get down to it, I want to be sure that I do not beg the question as I fear so many do today. 
That is, if to filioque way or not to filioque way concerns what we believe about God, what we often call a profession of faith in our Eucharist, well, then I want to get it right. And as part and parcel thereof, it seems to me that we also need to ask what warrants our doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already noted that the warrant of antiquity, if we should subscribe to it, is of little help. The great Carol and divine Lancelot Andrews spoke about the boundaries of the Anglican Christian faith, obviously in addition to Holy Scripture. But he talked about the boundaries as being three creeds, four general councils, five centuries, and the series of fathers in that period. However, Andrews's boundaries are of little help when the creeds and the councils and the theologians' teachings are themselves the question. So where do we turn? Where do we go next? Well, two wants are usually invoked. The first is a canonical want to the effect that the creed, the Nicene Creed, is sacrosanct and therefore must be translated literally, perhaps transliterated, to preserve its integrity and to signal its authority. The second bond is that of unity, usually under the aegis of ecumenism. Now, roughly, this warrant has it that despite differences, some taken to be large and some taken to be small, our understanding of the doctrine, that our common belief is best served by a translation of the creed acceptable to both East and West. Now, this canonical warrant. This canonical warrant has a, is a warrant in which much is made about the authority of general councils. In Roman Catholic and Orthodox circles in particular, there is a common mind about the authority of councils, and particularly the councils in question regarding the filioque. The East is quick to say that the Council of Ephesus in 431 had forbidden the production of any new creeds in its seven canon. Therefore, says the East, the filioque is an interpolation and uncanonical and illegal and unwarranted addition, even in translation. Now, the West, well, the West is quick to respond that nothing's been added to the creed because the West never added anything to the creed in terms of the Greek text. Many Western bishops, including popes, joyfully profess the creed in the original Greek and advocate dropping the filioque in translation. But there is no consensus because there are many more Western bishops, including popes, who believe that a profession of the creed in Latin or other Western languages without the filioque is inadequate to the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a very particular and peculiar interpretation as regards Roman Catholicism, which is Christianity's largest denomination. Since the 15th century, at the Council of Ferrara, Florence, when some of the Eastern churches decided to remain or to return to the authority of the Pope, those churches, which today are usually called Eastern Rites, sometimes uniate Catholics, those who returned or those who maintained that they had always been under the authority of the Pope, there are many takes on this, those churches do not use the filioque, even though they acknowledge the Pope. They are free to filioque or not to filioque during their Eucharistic liturgies. But there's a catch. They must hold to a theology that accepts the double procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. The Leonine solution holds to this day in Rome, where the term is not the point, but the doctrine. And that, as lost be averse, is why unity is elusive between Rome and Constantinople, between West and East. Now, Anglicans, Episcopalians, and Reformed Christians, to be sure, do not recognize papal authority and are not so well disposed to the authority of councils. From an Anglican point of view, I would quote Article 21 of the Articles of Religion, 
which, whilst not to be taken as authoritative on their own or because of their pedigree, do more or less represent reform thinking. This article in particular, when it says councils may err and sometimes have erred, even in things pertaining unto God, wherefore things ordained by them as necessary to salvation have neither strength nor authority unless it may be declared that they be taken out of Holy Scripture. For Anglicans and the Reformed, it begs the question of the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit to claim the question is answered by or dependent upon creeds or councils. Now getting to this second warrant, the warrant of unity or ecumenism, much has been made and much continues to be made and is well made to the idea of Christians professing the same faith at the Eucharist throughout the whole church of God. Back in the 19th century, 1874, 1875, old Catholics and Orthodox began consultations in Bonn. The old Catholics agreed to drop the filioque way until the present day, of course, an enormous amount of effort by East and West has been put into dousing the fire of the great schism. And that was helpful when the old Catholics dropped the filioque way. A segment of that effort, though, resulted not only in them dropping the filioque way in the 19th century, but a century later, formally rejecting the doctrine of the filioque way and formally accepting an orthodox understanding of relations in the Holy Trinity, as Shem in 1975. In other words, it took them 100 years, 1875, to drop the word, and 100 years later, in 1975, to drop the doctrine. Thus, for the old Catholics, the filioque controversy may be settled and resolved. But as for us, I don't know if there are any old Catholics here, but as for us, those who are Anglican or Reformed, I'm sorry to say that things filioque-esque have not gone so smoothly. Anglican and Reformed theologians and church leaders had been just as actively engaged with the East and with the old Catholics in the 19th century. Anglicans in particular were observers there in Bonn in 1975 and worked on this situation for almost 100 years themselves until they came up with the Moscow Agreed Statement, as it's called, in 1976. That statement called for a dropping of the filioque from the creed. So a bunch of Anglicans got together and said, we should drop the filioque from the creed. And they had three basic reasons. They said, because the original form of the creed referred only to the Holy Spirit from the Father, as we've seen. They said because the filioque cause was introduced into the creed without the authority of an ecumenical council, as we've seen. And also because the creed constitutes the public confession of faith by the people of God at the Eucharist. They said for that reason too, the filioque cause should not be included because it was divisive. What is sadly missing though in that statement is any warrant from scripture to drop the filial play. In any case, this Moscow agreed statement led to Resolution 35 of the Lambeth Conference in 1978, which called upon provinces of the Anglican Union, as Bishop Kevin said, to drop the filial play. And so in the SEC, it didn't appear in the next liturgy in 1982. It came up again at Lambeth 1988, but by 1998, and again, Lambeth conferences are every 10 years for those who aren't not familiar with them, by 2008, it had kind of fallen off the radar. The Anglican theologian Gerald Gray notes this, and I quote, subsequent reflection has confirmed that Anglicans are divided about the proper interpretation of the relevant passage of scripture and would not be prepared to condemn the Western tradition, even if the filioque would drop. So 
as of today, for example, in the Church of England, it has not yet been dropped, although there are many occasions when groups in the Church of England gather and recite the creed and don't use the filioque. Right? And there are continuing calls for members of the Anglican Communion to drop the filioque formally right up until the so-called Dublin Agreement in 2015. But yet, it hasn't quite happened. See, the Anglican trajectory vis-a-vis the filioque is basically that of the Western Reformed churches. The Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches convened a working party to study the filioque controversy in 1979. The resulting document was entitled Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, Ecumenical Reflections on the Filioque Controversy. But as things go, as with Bonn and Moscow, it's usually called the Klingendal Memorandum after the town in Saxony where they met. And the Klingendal Memorandum made two assertions regarding the doctrine and the term filioque. As to the doctrine, it said, it should not be said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, for this would efface the difference in his relationship to the Father and to the Son. And as to the term, it said, the original form of the creed without the filioque should everywhere be recognized as the normative one and restored so that the whole Christian people may be able to confess their common faith in the Holy Spirit. The problem, of course, is that the question has been begged, has it not? Was it then, or is it now, has it ever been the case that the doctrine of the filioque faces the difference in the Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son? Well, time precludes an inventory of theologians who think the opposite, but I mentioned two, St. Augustine of Hippo, who I'm going to claim as an Anglican, despite the retronym, in the sense that Anglicanism continues the traditions of the early church, and Karl Barth on the reform side, both of them pretty heavy hitters. And I'm going to stop there to make the point that there never was, nor is now, such a consensus, at least in the West. Furthermore, would simply dropping the term filioque from translations of the creed really lead the whole Christian people to a common faith in the Holy Spirit vis-a-vis procession? I wish that were true, but I'm sorry to say it would not. It comes as little surprise that less than 10 years later, in 1988, Hans-Georg Link, writing on behalf of the World Council of Churches, would lament that the Klingenthal Memorandum had, and I quote, so far found no echo worth speaking of in the churches. He goes on to say that there is need to differentiate much more clearly between the Christological legitimacy and the canonical illegitimacy of the edition and from the Son. So obviously what he's saying is that we have to be careful to distinguish the doctrine from the term. That was only 10 years later, less than a decade. So like a canonical warrant, a warrant of unity or ecumenical concord has failed insofar as we find ourselves left with the filioque putatively rubbed out and a papering over of the doctrine too thin to hold up, even to hold together for a decade. Thus, my brothers and sisters, to filioque or not to filioque is not a question of one or another voice of ecclesiastical authority, papal, conciliar, or otherwise. To say so begs the question of our belief. To filioque or not to filioque is not a question of ecumenism or unity in terms of dropping the term and ignoring the doctrine for the sake of a full sense of communion. That too begs the question of our belief. So what then is the question? 
Well, the question, at least as I understand it, is working on and working out what we believe about the procession of the Holy Spirit. It is a question of doctrine, not of terminology, even one so fraught as the Filioque, wherewith we unproductively think that we must take sides vis-a-vis -vis the term. Rather than see the mess we have gotten ourselves into, this mess as an invitation, perhaps an invitation of the Holy Spirit himself to renew our theological speculation and to return to God's inspired word in order to do so. That is, in the language of the Articles of Religion, to recall that anything to be received and believed must be proved by the warrant of Scripture, and that we need not take anything as an article of faith without Scripture's warrant. And to recall that, at least in this branch of the Catholic Church, and for many Reformed churches, we have received and believed three creeds, the Apostles, the Athanasian, and the Nicene, for one reason. For they may be proved by most certain wants of Holy Scripture. Now that said, I don't want to fall into the trap of begging the question myself by blithely saying that we must attend to Holy Scripture as if God's revelation of his oneness in three or his threeness in one is so obvious that just a new or renewed glance at the Bible will settle this controversy. No, far from it. Instead, I'd like to address the warrant of Scripture in terms of the filioque, way, both the term and the doctrine, in four points. Now, bear with me, because they're a bit interrelated, as it were, and I don't want to extend them too long, so they're a bit concise as well as interrelated. First, as you already mentioned, the only warrant for doctrine is Scripture. We have seen that the tradition of the Church of God is unsettled, unresolved, and that it yields no clear answer. We've also seen that even if we had an unbroken, univocal, and uniform witness in the East and the West, or both, it would not matter unless the substance of that witness could be proved by Scripture. We've touched also upon the fact that doctrine is not a matter of terminology or unaided reason or debate. Doctrine is not, as that Byzantine fellow reminds us at Ferrara Florence so long ago, it's not a matter of solving a philosophical puzzle, not a matter of coming to an agreement about Aristotelian terms or other philosophical systems. What we know of the triune God, as opposed to God's works, comes to us from supernatural revelation alone. That's my first point. My second point is that there is no warrant in Holy Scripture for us to choose sides on the filioque controversy that we have created. There is no warrant, as if there were two houses to please, or two churches, completely separate and distinct, east and west, that had to come to a common mind or compromise, if you will. There's no warrant for a political or diplomatic solution as to whether or not we use the word filioque in a creed that we have composed even if the creed borrows language from the biblical text. Churches, as you know, must agree their liturgical texts, or other texts for that matter. The only warrant is whether or not the faith, the belief, the doctrine of those texts be true to Scripture. For example, again, in the Scottish Episcopal Church, we have interpreted our texts differently, for example, in order to ordain women some decades ago. We had changed our text in order to witness the marriage of persons of the same sex quite recently. And we continue to grapple with our text, the creed aside for the moment, like our Eucharistic prayers, in order to understand what we mean when we say something like real presence. But all the while, 
Holy Scripture is not just the bottom line. It's not the least common denominator, but it's the bar we must reach to be true to God's revelation and to our own developing understanding thereof. That's my second. My third is this. In terms of the filioque controversy then, following on from antiquity, it is clear that a specific doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit has not been believed everywhere, always, and by all. Full stop. As diverse understandings developed in the East and the West, chiefly as the creed made its way into the Eucharistic liturgies, diverse understandings were developed, and they remain to this day. And personally, I find no want to see that as a problem. That's my third point. My fourth point is this. We ought to pray as we believe and believe as we pray. The stakes rose when the creed began to be and is still recited Sunday after Sunday in Eucharistic liturgies all over the world with and without the filioque. So the issue of filioque or not filioque in recitations of the creed is really a question of belief. If we do pray as we believe and believe as we pray, and if we find ourselves in a quandary, as we certainly do about what we believe about the procession of the Holy Spirit, then we are obliged, we are obliged to enhance our understanding, not to retreat to lines drawn in the sand a millennium and a half ago, not to rub them out as if there are no differences, but instead to pray for God's light and to study God's word. I began our time together by saying that there would be no settlement to the filioque controversy this evening, no resolution. And as you've no doubt gathered, there's none in sight. There is a fellow though, who just wrote a book. Well, it came out in 2010. When you get to be my age, 2010 is just. Um, named Edward Susinski. He published, I think, the most thorough history of the controversy to date. And he says in the epilogue of his book, a complete history of the filioque debate cannot yet be written. It remains unresolved. I do not know where the debate goes from here. The optimist in me believes a resolution is possible, but a sober analysis of the history also demonstrates that optimism, as it concerns the filioque, is often unwarranted. So back to Warren's then. I can answer the question implied by the title of my talk, to filioque or not to filioque, the warrant of Holy Scripture. I can answer it by saying surely that our hearts need not be troubled by this lack. Of resolution. On the one hand, there is no warrant in Holy Scripture to settle this human-made controversy, and there is no warrant in Scripture to recite creeds, even the Nicene Creed. On the other hand, there are two warrants from Scripture to bear in mind as we Anglican and Reformed Christians find ourselves as the inheritors of this seemingly unending controversy in the 21st century, a controversy that continues to smolder like a kind of a theological Gehenna where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Yes, there are two warrants from scripture and both fall from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first is when Jesus prays to the Father in John 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
these verses, at least as I read them, are not about Christians being in lockstep about terminology or even doctrine, but about believing in the one who was sent. The second one, again from our Lord, is when Jesus says in John 8, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So to conclude, should we filioque or not filioque? As I see it, we are free to do one, both, or none. We are free to filioque or not to filioque as we process our faith. But as we profess our faith, we are not free to profess what we do not believe. The warrant of Holy Scripture about the filioque controversy, or perhaps about any matter of doctrine, is to abide in God's word and to ask nothing more of our sisters and brothers in Christ other than to join us in prayer and study as we seek to develop our understanding of the mysteries of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you very much.